everyone and welcome to Sunday Online. It's wonderful to have you with us uh, for this time of worship together. This week uh, I've been continuing to read through some of the Psalms and uh, I read Psalm 66 and I thought that I would uh, read some of those verses uh, for us as we begin uh, our time of worship together. Uh, really encouraging verses, reminding us of why we worship God, why we serve him uh, and who he is. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. I love that idea uh, where it says, say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Uh, it's a wonderful invitation for us to, to tell God why we think he's so great, why we think he's so awesome. And uh, we can do that together as we come to worship now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are such a good God. We thank you that your deeds are awesome, that your power is great. And Lord, we thank you that you have placed within our hearts a desire uh, to praise you a desire to sing about you, a desire to shout for joy to you. And we pray, Lord, that we will do that now, wherever we are, however we're feeling, whatever our circumstances, would you place that spirit of worship in our hearts and unite us together, physically separated and yet spiritually united as your people, coming together with this desire to praise you, to make your praise glorious. And we want to do that now and do that now in the name of Jesus. Amen.
His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. As always, uh, we would love to extend an invitation to you uh, to connect with us, to get in touch with us. Uh, again, this week I met someone for the first time who has been watching Sunday Online uh, over the last little while and it was wonderful to meet someone face to face uh, and to be able to, to get to know them. And uh, we'd love to do that with you too, so do get in touch uh, if there's any way in which we can help uh, if, we, if you have anything you'd like us to pray about, uh, any information, then please, please do get in touch. We want to take a moment again to thank everyone who gives towards uh, the life of the church. Uh, everything that we do is made possible through the generosity of God's people. And we want to thank you so much for that. And uh, just remind you that if you do uh, want to give uh, financially towards the work of the church, you can do so by the website, uh, by the church office. Uh, and we are so, so grateful uh, for all uh, that people give uh, to, to make possible what happens here. Many of you will know that coming up very soon, in just a few weeks, uh, there are several Alpha courses happening across the area. Uh, these are all in-person Alpha courses, uh, which may or may not be appropriate for you. However, uh, we all have a part to play uh, in inviting others, in making known uh, to others the fact that Alpha is happening and it might be just the right thing for them. And uh, at the church we have uh, lots and lots uh, of these invitations available with details on the back of the different courses taking place. There's a daytime one uh, here at the, the free, and there's an evening one here, but there's also one at Coastlands in Walton and at the Gospel Chapel in Frinton uh, on different nights of the week, different times. Uh, so there's something hopefully that everyone can access. So can we encourage you uh, to consider who you could invite? Uh, perhaps um, post this through someone's door or enclose a little note with it, inviting them. Um, it doesn't cost anything to invite someone and it might just be what they're waiting for uh, in their journey with God. So do let us know. Uh, if you'd like some of these invitations and we can get them to you. And uh, let's just watch this video which reminds us uh, of the power of invitation and the difference that it can make uh, in, with the Alpha Course. This old friend of mine, Helen. My best friend. My friend Colin invited me to try Alpha. Y recuerdo que mi papá me dijo, mira, hay comida gratis, ve. They handed me a invitation. It was just a random invitation. And I said like, why not, why not, let's try it. Why not, let's go. And I found like a, like a really awesome community of people. They helped me find who I was just by listening. Alpha helped me in the knowing of God. Empecé a entender que el amor Es de muchas maneras. I just knew 
I was a different person from that moment on. I knew I had purpose. I, I felt really comfortable and like starting to invite my friends. I've seen Alpha really impact people that I work with. I would definitely encourage people to get involved. It's one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. It all turned out to be life-changing. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams are abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Lord, Our Lord and loving Heavenly Father, the psalmists of old praised you as they considered the wonders of your creation and all these years later we marvel as modern equipment enables the scientists of today to delve farther beyond what the ancient world could ever have imagined and they continue to discover more as they probe farther and farther into space. 
Lord, we can't find words to praise you for your great power and find it beyond amazing that the one who set the stars in space cares about us. The words of the Gospels records Jesus saying that the very hairs on our head are numbered. You know and care that much for each of us and we find it hard to take this in. But when we see your power at work in individual lives and situations today, we know that we can trust your word and we praise and thank you, Lord. We thank you for your love and care shown to us, your children, for all that you provide for us day by day, that we live in a land of comparative plenty. Help us never to take your blessings for granted and be willing to share what we have to help those in need in our own area, in our land and beyond. We ask for your guidance as we seek to share the good news of your gospel and thank you that with the other churches in Frinton we were able to run FM, praying that seeds sown and conversations that took place will encourage many to think about you and that the upcoming Alpha courses will be well attended. We pray too that you will guide us as a church in making wise decisions as to the way forward. As a new academic year is soon to begin, we pray that all students, from the youngest starting in reception classes, to those embarking on further education, help them and those teaching them to settle into a satisfactory routine. And for those who are undecided as to their next steps, for whatever reason, we pray that they may be guided aright by those trained to give such help. We pray especially for RE teachers and that the lessons offered by Walk Through the Bible, Open the Book and other organisations will be made well known and will result in many pupils and teachers seeking to know more of you. As we think about our land, we pray that for our government in such turmoil at this time, for the next elected leader and for all in Parliament, praying that those who profess your name will have a clear voice to be able to encourage wise decisions to be made, we dare to ask that your Holy Spirit will hover over this nation to convict and draw us back to being a nation that honours you. And Lord, as we look across the world, we see so much that makes our hearts sad. We pray for help for all who have bowed low because of war, famine, abuse, traffic and so many other problems. And we thank you for those who have taken up the various challenges to help alleviate suffering. May they find strength and energy to be able to help where they are placed. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with our praise and as children to a loving father with our concerns and our requests. Oh Lord, help us never to take this for granted. We pray in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Our theme for this morning, uh, in a moment, is going to be the cost of living. And I've chosen as the passage that we're going to be looking at today, uh, a, a passage from Luke chapter 14, uh, which in, in this Bible is entitled, The Cost of being a disciple. And uh, so I'm going to read from verse 25 to 35. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. 
Won't you, worst, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Ever since I knew that I would be speaking to you today, I've been asking God what he wanted me to share. Some key ideas and words have emerged over the weeks and as I was preparing, I felt drawn to this passage in Luke 14. It's not the easiest of passages, but one which I feel God will speak to us through today. And let's start by qualifying the title. We're not talking about inflation, or fuel costs, although God does care very much about these things. Rather, we're talking about the cost of living for Jesus. In the passage from Luke 14, which we just read, Jesus was speaking to the crowd. But as one commentator puts it, he was calling not for spectators, but for recruits. When he called people to follow him, he meant them not to tag along behind him out of curiosity, but to throw in their lot with him in commitment. So let me begin with a question. How serious are you about Jesus? How serious am I? Jesus gives his listeners three challenges. Three challenges which face us if we choose to be serious about following Jesus. Firstly, how much do you love me? Verse 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Jesus asks us to love him more than we do our own family. He uses a literary device which doesn't literally mean that we have to hate our family. Instead, it's a typical biblical way of expressing preference, which means to love this rather than that. Love for our family is to be so far surpassed by our love for Jesus that in comparison, it will seem like hatred. You will know that for many, the decision to become a Christian does involve being rejected by their family. Let me tell you about Nadia, who lives in Pakistan. When Nadia left Islam to follow Christ, her family were furious. They grew even angrier when in 2014 she married Alim, a Christian whose family had been Christians for generations. Nadia's Muslim relatives felt that she had dishonored them all by what she had done, so they set out to restore the family honor. After the wedding, Alim and Nadia, knowing themselves to be in danger, fled to another town. Nadia's mother stayed in contact with her daughter by telephone. After a while, she told Nadia that the family had forgiven the couple and asked them to come and meet them. Trustingly, the couple traveled to a famous Muslim shrine and waited in a rickshaw. Suddenly, 
Nadia's father, her brother and a stranger got into the rickshaw and forced the driver at gunpoint to take them to a farm where they were attacked. Nadia survived, but her husband didn't. We may not be rejected by our family for following Jesus, but are we willing to be? Jesus asks us today, how much do you love me? Secondly, how much will you sacrifice for me? Verse 27 says, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus asks us to carry our cross. In other words, to surrender absolutely to God's authority. In doing so, he's not asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done. Just a short time after speaking these words, Jesus literally carried his cross as he walked to his death. Elsewhere, Jesus says about himself, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The bottom line is, am I willing to die for Jesus? The fact is that for many of our brothers and sisters around the world today, this is a real question, a real choice that they make every day because their faith in Jesus puts their lives at risk. Let me share just one story, which makes quite difficult listening. Some of you will remember that on Easter Day in 2019, several churches in Sri Lanka were attacked by suicide bombers. That very morning at Zion Evangelical Church in Batakaloa, The Sunday school teachers asked the children, how many of you are willing to die for Christ? Every child raised their hand. Minutes later, the class was over. The children spilled out to play in the church grounds while the adult congregation gathered inside for the main Easter worship service. It was then that a suspicious looking stranger was ushered out of the building by a church member. He was a suicide bomber. And that day he killed at least 15 adults and 14 of the children who had just pledged their willingness to die for Christ. We may not be asked to give our life for Jesus, but are we willing to do so? That's the level of sacrifice he's asking for. Thirdly, how much will you give? In verses 28 to 33, Jesus gives two illustrations. First, of a building, which has to be budgeted for in terms of financial resources. And then of a battle, which has to be planned for in terms of human resources. In both situations, the challenge is the same. Do I have enough to complete the task? And in this case, enough means everything. Jesus requires total service, total commitment. There's no room for provisos, for for conditions, for ifs and buts. Let me give you some current examples of what Christians are having to give because of their faith. These stories come from the Open Doors website, working to support persecuted Christians. Imagine not being able to access your workplace or being treated unfairly once you get there. In Nigeria, Christian farmers can't access their land as it's been taken over by militants. Also in Nigeria, Christian men are being discriminated against by the government's armed forces. Christian soldiers are being sent to the most dangerous parts of the country, where they're more at risk of being killed. Imagine being ostracised by your community and having your finances cut off. In China, Christians who leave Buddhism to follow Jesus are threatened and abused by their families and communities. 
Women are sometimes divorced by their husbands. And some people have had their homes destroyed and their government benefits cancelled. We may not suffer in these ways, but are we willing to give everything for Jesus? His message is uncompromising. Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Going God's way takes precedence over everything else. And Jesus invites each of us, each day, to make that decision to follow him and how we express our love for him, how much we're prepared to sacrifice for him, and how much of ourselves we're willing to give him. Through everyday choices, God regularly tests our commitment by bringing us to a fork in the road. Commentator Michael Wilcock imagines God challenging us in this way. Suppose I were to lead you towards work in which your income would be lower, your prospects more uncertain, your accustomed standard of living non-existent. Or suppose I were to ask you to do something for me which, according to most people, is simply not done. Would you even then come my way? When it becomes necessary to choose between two ways, which do we follow? Comfort, convention, custom, or Christ? The test from the very outset has been, follow me. Earlier in Luke's Gospel, Jesus challenges his disciples with these words. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? This is one of the great paradoxes of the Christian life. The best way to live is to give up your life. The best way to live is to sacrifice your own life, your own plans, your own desires, your own priorities, and to follow Jesus. We are invited into a relationship of complete submission and dependence like that of sheep and the shepherd. Jesus knows what's best for us and he knows that the best way is to follow him and listen to his voice. As he promised, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Michael Wilcock again, that is what it means to be a disciple. That is the distinctive saltiness of the salt, the thing that makes it what it is, the discipleship which characterises the disciples of Jesus. The time is now. The person concerned is you, just as you are. The demand is everything. Now, if you're anything like me, you may be feeling quite daunted at this point. It's all very well talking about total commitment, ultimate sacrifice, giving up everything and laying down your life for God. And of course, this is what we want. This is how we want to live. But what does this mean practically for me today? This year as a church, We've been focusing on the fundamental building blocks of our faith, being rooted in prayer, which we looked at in the spring, in worship, which we've been considering this summer, and in God's word, which we'll be looking at in the autumn. And next year, we're going to be spending some time looking at the whole area of discipleship, moving from being rooted to growing in our faith and sowing the seeds of the gospel in our community. But in the meantime, let me give you a few pointers to help you get going. 
First of all, start small. Zechariah 4 verse 10 says, do not despise the day of small things or small beginnings. Our God is a God of small things. He uses the small to achieve great things. This is the God who chose one man, Abraham, to found a nation, who incidentally was 75 years old when God first called him. He chose one small nation among many, Israel, to model the relationship between God and humankind. This is the God who decided that Jesus, the divine Son of God, would be born as a human baby with all the limitations that involved. This is the God who tells his disciples that they only need faith the size of a mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds, to do seemingly impossible things. This is the God who takes the weak, the foolish, the despised, and turns them into strength, wisdom, and honor. Why does God do this? Because it means we're more dependent on him. It means we do things in his strength rather than our own. It means we don't boast about our own achievements, but we boast in the Lord and give glory to him. Secondly, start with the one. During one of the team meetings, in Frinton Mission Week, Mark reminded us that the Gospels record between 40 and 50 individual encounters with Jesus during his ministry on earth. Yes, he spoke to crowds, but he also spoke to the one. And when he healed, he healed one at a time. Each person matters. As you look back at how you met God and began a relationship of discipleship with him, there will be certain individuals who stand out. They took time for you. Can I encourage you to take time for the one? One simple way in which you can do this is by writing a six-word testimony and then sharing it. This involves summarising what your relationship with Jesus means to you in just six words. Let me give you some examples from members of of our church who were on the Love Frinton, Love Walton team during Frinton Mission where we were encouraged to do this. Black and white, now in colour. Crippled by sin, now set free. Heart of stone, heart of flesh. Jesus is my peace, my everything. Rejected, broken, Jesus. Found, loved, home. It's powerful because it's personal to you and you'll be much more confident sharing it with other people. Can I encourage you to try try doing this yourself and then share it with one other person this week? Maybe someone who already has a relationship with Jesus or with someone who doesn't yet. In this way, your conversation will be seasoned with salt, as it says in Colossians 4. Thirdly, start by listening. The passage that we read from Luke 14 ends like this. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. It's very simple. Ask God to speak to you and then listen to him. In John 10, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And if you're listening to this, realising that you don't yet have this close relationship with God, that you're not following Jesus, can I encourage you to do so? This is what the Christian faith is all about, recognising that we can't live life on our own, that we need a saviour, and that by deciding to follow him, by asking for his forgiveness and inviting his presence in our lives, we find life, we find freedom, 
we find new purpose. If that's you, I would love to send you a New Testament so that you can read about Jesus' life for yourself and discover what an incredible person he is and how much he is worth giving up everything for. Please get in touch with us, contact the church, and we will send you a New Testament so that you can read this for yourself. I can guarantee that it will change your life forever. And finally, start now. In Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, several times we read this. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't put it off. Don't wait for a better time. Say yes to him now. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to live for us, to die for us. And we want to invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and move in our hearts and minds right now. We invite you, we wait for you. We're going to use this worship song to help us as we wait on God together. Salvation, you loved us from the start. 
Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for going before us, for showing us how life should be lived. And we want to take this opportunity now to say yes again to you. To say to you that we love you, that we want to give up everything for you. That living for you is the most important thing in our lives. Would you fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit? Help us to hear your voice, to listen to you. To believe in the God who takes the small and the weak and those lacking in confidence and transforms them into something wonderful. And for anyone listening who doesn't yet follow Jesus, you may want to pray this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. I'm sorry for trying to live life my own way. Please would you forgive me and would you come and give me that gift of life. Life for now and life forever. Fill me with your spirit and help me to follow you with all that I am and all that I have. And we ask all of these things through Jesus who showed us the way to live. Amen.
confess How beautiful the grace that gives to us All that we don't deserve All that we cannot learn But it's the gift of love There is a new song